This is Taco Incident, where we learn the secrets of breakthrough brand experience from the most brilliant leaders while we're on the search for the perfect taco. Join us on Taco Stop number six, Adventures in Brand Impact. I met up with Davis Smith at Taqueria 27 in Holiday, Utah. In only five years, his outdoor clothing company, Kotopaxi, is rivaling legacy competitors with immersive experiences and purpose-driven strategies to do good that are deeply embedded into its brand DNA. I wanted to learn why he believes in the power of brand experience, what he does to create it, and how it's helped him thrive, all over tacos. It really doesn't get much better than this. We have the chorizo right here. Mm. I will put the duck in front of you since it's your mm. go-to now. Wow. And then this is the al pastor. Mm -hmm. Okay. The classic. Do you guys want any, like fresh limes? Bingo. Okay. Great. Yeah, that's cool. exactly I'll right. That and return that. Okay. Thank you. Oh my gosh, it smells yeah. great. I think you're gonna love this one. I'm excited. Go you want to do it? duck first? I'll Here, do duck let's first. Let's just swap these. Here. Oh yeah, yeah. Good idea. Here, stick it right here. So my wife and we have four kids, yeah. as you know, and uh, we went down, we spent five weeks in Mexico last summer um, in the Yucatan, so just south of, of Cancun. Uh -huh. Little tiny town, 5,000 people, and we just go to the market all the time, and we, we made guacamole like every day. And I made, like every morning we'd have smoothies <laughs> from like, oh, it was amazing. So yeah. the food was fantastic. There was a couple little taco places yeah. around, some other great, great food, and yeah. um, no, like no tourists in this little tiny town. So it was, uh, it was awesome. Yeah. Or very few tourists. So you didn't stand out at all, right? No, I blend right in. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I love that my kids got an experience. You know, I, I grew up in Latin America, as you yeah. know, and um, moved there when I was four years old, lived there my entire childhood, and then moved back as an adult, um, lived in Bolivia and Peru, and um, then Brazil mm -hmm. with my wife and kids. And, um, so yeah, I wanted my kids to make sure they had experiences there. You know, they develop a love for that community and that culture like like I did. So yeah. it was it was special. That's yeah. cool. You are super big on like creating experiences for your family, for yourself, for your friends, for like your business. So mm -hmm. where did all this like love for just mm -hmm. and zest for exploring all that life has to offer? Where does that come from? I didn't come from money. But, you know my. You know, very middle class family, large family, eight kids in my family. I'm the second of eight. And uh, so we couldn't afford expensive vacations, but we were living in these kind of exotic, amazing, amazing places. places. Yeah. And so, and my dad is an adventurer. So we, you know, we made our own raft and we floated the Amazon River fishing for piranha. And, you know, we'd, we'd go survive on islands and stuff, <laughs> yeah. and making our own spears. So yeah, yeah. that was my childhood. I grew up, you know, my brother and I, every day after school, we'd go to this jungle right next to our home and we'd, I mean, we would swing on vines. We had, we like kind of, it was, it was an idyllic childhood. And, wow. um, but I, I just learned to love the outdoors. I, I, I connected with the people and felt a, a deep um, sense of empathy for others. And I knew that I wanted to find a way to, yeah. to help people later on in my life. And, but the sense of adventure, like it stuck with me. And so I've always, anytime I'm, uh, I mean, that's all I think about, really, is like, uh, when's the next adventure and who can I go on it with? And, um, you know, I love having people experience some of the stuff for the first time. So that's it's a lot oh, of fun. Yeah. So and then, you know, I kind of built that into this business, you know, with with Cotopaxi. Yeah. So it's uh, something I, I believe in. I mean, because you started started Cotopaxi, you know, going up against like legacy brands, huge years of like long, like almost a century what made you decide to kind of go at it the way that you chose and what is what how has that looked for for yeah. Baxi? so i'd say you know first of all and go ahead and eat your chorizo <laughs> uh, taco uh you know i there was a why um with this business before i knew exactly what i would do hmm. um i i've known my entire life i needed to do something like this um hmm. that could impact lives and um, something in outdoor retail or no, something, no, no. something with the model? With a social mission. Mm. And I didn't know how to do it. And so mm. um, I started my, my first business with that goal in mind. And my first two businesses didn't have a social mission. Um, 
I didn't understand how to connect that mission to the mm. brand or the business in a way that made sense. And so I, you're just building up experience, like this is how you run a business, this is yeah, how you grow so a business. This is how you but, hire great people. This is, right. you know, I learned a lot of mistakes you know, along the way, you know, but um, ultimately I, it kind of clicked and I had this idea of that I could build a business that could inspire people to do good with me, that could move people to do mm. good and that would, you know, ins you know, inspire people to, where it wasn't just me doing good or me like trying to help people, but it was like a movement. Hmm. And uh, I wasn't sure what that business would be at first, but within, I mean, really within 48 hours of having this idea, I knew I would do something in the outdoor space. Really? Yeah. What, how did it just like, came to you, inspiration, like yeah. kind of combining a lot of your passions together or? So it, it, it was basically, so I'd flown back, I was in China for work, I was living in Brazil, but I was in China for work and I flew back to Brazil to long, it was like 40 hours of travel. So I was like pretty jet lagged, um, laying in bed, but couldn't sleep. I was just, this was on my mind. I, I, I like knew, what the next move was gonna be. Yeah, and yeah. The, that I felt this, I felt this drive to go do something more meaningful. Hmm. Um, you know, I was back in Latin America. I was, you know, we're living in this high rise, you know, surrounded by people with a lot of money and you look out the window and you see a shanty town right below you the that you drive past right? yeah, favela, yeah. yeah, that you drive by every single day. And um, every day it was a reminder of like, I'm really lucky. Like I didn't do anything to deserve this life. I, I'm not better or smarter or more deserving or harder working than these other people. Yeah. I just, I just got lucky in where I was born. Mm. And um, I knew that uh, it was time. It was time for me, and so I I resigned. I ended up resigning from my role as as co CEO of, of that last business, and I started. Um, but the, you know that night, as I was laying in bed, I I had some ideas start coming to my mind, and I, mm -hmm. I wrote them down on my phone. Kind of rolled over and wrote them down, and thought I'd be able to maybe go to sleep and come back to those thoughts in the morning. But more thoughts started coming. I, I wrote them down again, and then pretty Flat soon I just yeah, pretty soon I just left. I went out and sat on a couch and. Uh, in our in our living room, and I I was in Sao Paulo. Two, in Sao Paulo, yeah. And for uh, two straight nights, two days and two straight nights, I didn't sleep. I just, I wow. this entire our slogan gear for good, the Questival events, really the, the early ideas for the Questival, yeah, the llama and the logo, like everything was the name Cotopaxi, which is the name of a yeah, volcano yeah, yeah. where I grew up in Ecuador, and um, that it just kind of came to me. I, I never had an experience like that before. I probably wow. never will again, um, but. Um, I kind of knew what I needed to do, and so, um, but I wanted to build a brand that was, that was more than just selling outdoor gear. It was there was purpose built and baked into the very DNA of this business, and um, and also I wanted experiences to be part of that. So, you know, we launched the first day that we turned on our website. We had the first Questival, this twenty-four hour adventure <laughs> race, which was nuts. Yeah, yeah, it's so, nuts. I participated in one in San Francisco. Oh, that's right. I remember the this. first that's one right. you did there. That's right, and it was. Mm -hmm. Such a riot. Like we, I, at some point we like jumped into the bay, in the water, I was wearing a tuxedo shirt. I don't even remember why. <laughs> We've probably done a hundred, probably over a hundred questivals wow. around the country. Um, so the idea like everyone, when you do the race, you sign up, you get one of our backpacks. So you're using our product the whole race. Yeah. And um, we have an app that we developed. You sign up on this app and uh, it gives you hundreds of challenges that you're choosing from. And you go out and complete them. They're everything from giving service in the community mm -hmm. to doing stuff in the outdoors to quirky, funny kind of challenges. And people are sharing them on social media. Um, you know, our first Questel, we had 30,000 social media posts of people wearing our backpacks, doing these amazing adventures and giving service in the community. So it was just a great way for people to go live the, the brand values of Cotopaxi. Yeah. And then they become evangelists. They, they've lived the brand. They believe in it. They understand what it stands for. Yeah. And uh, so that was that was pretty awesome. Totally immersive brand experience. Yeah. How has that been transformative for you guys as a business versus just going about like a normal, having a normal marketing department? Mm -hmm. How has experience and why did you decide to make that kind of a hallmark of, of what it is that, that you're all about? So we target millennial consumers. Uh, but what I saw was there was an opportunity, this young consumer, they, I think they think a lot, like I did, around humanity. Mm. 
and just thinking we need to do more as as a as a global community to mm. to lift others. Yeah. And um, millennials are especially passionate about this issue. And I thought, you know, no one's done that. No one's built a brand around people, around mm. humanity. And that's what I really wanted to do. And so, you know, we wanted to inject it into everything that we did. So when you order from our website, you'll get a handwritten thank you card with your order that's written by a refugee. Mm. And it's their very first job. You know, they're writing in their native language. They've been resettled here to Salt Lake City. Um, they'll write it in Arabic or in French or whatever their native language is. And, and if you're a customer, you get this thank you card. And it, mm. it just, it's meaningful. Yeah. And it kind of ties back to that, that story. Um, you know, we use, we have some great stories of the communities. I'm wearing some socks right now that are um, made out of Bolivian llama wool. It's one of these places I used to live. They live in, there's a little community of like 200 people. Um, sorry, the, the, you know, this, these tiny little communities, they make like $200 a year. And uh, they live in extreme poverty. And um, their children oftentimes are going and working in mines, anything they can to go make supplemental income for their families. And, you know, there needed to be stories and experiences that, that connected the brand to people yeah. more than just um, selling amazing gear. Um, you know, in our, our earliest days, I was in Brazil. I had the idea. I put together a small team of people that I felt I needed to go build the brand. Yeah. As we sat down, I kind of just laid out my vision for what I wanted this brand to stand for. And I, I remember talking about how I didn't want to be the, another outdoor brand that like sponsors some athlete to jump out of a helicopter and have an avalanche chase after them as they ski down a mountain. That to me just was not inspiring. It wasn't aspirational for me. It actually was out of reach for me. I, you know, that wasn't something I would ever do. Um, and I said, you know, I'd rather, if we're going to sponsor anyone, I'd rather just go sponsor a couple of kids that take a year out of work or school and they go travel the world connecting with communities and giving back and serving others. And like, that's who we, that's who we are. That's what we stand for. And so we tried to build a brand around that. So in, in that whole process, I mean, it's super inspiring, but it can, I would imagine that there was also maybe some pushback from mm -hmm. either investors or, or friends or like, Oh, that's too pie in the sky. That's mm. too like what? What did that pushback look like? So I mean, a lot of or was there? Pushback? Oh, there was pushback. <laughs> yeah, there was pushback. I mean, a lot of investors just said, "This What's is the ROI on doing good." Right? Yeah, exactly. You're giving away money before you make yeah. money. That doesn't make sense to right. us. Like there were a lot of investors that were just like, "Look, I'm not interested in funding a benefit corporation. Mm. You guys are going to be giving away money for years before you make anything," and that's been true. Um, you know, we've we've given away every profit we've ever made and more. Mm -hmm. um, but I believe that long term, this business is, you know, we're building a viable brand and business that will be able to, to sustainably do good and create returns for investors. And um, it's also a very saturated space, a very, very competitive industry, you know, thousands of outdoor brands. And, you know, how do you stand out? But, uh, you know, this mission, because it, it's so core to who we are as a, as a company, as a culture, as a brand that um, people feel the authenticity behind what we're building and that, that matters. What is, what's the, at the heart of that for you? Like what gets you up every day and so energized and excited about making Cotopoxy be successful? Yeah. I mean, I think it, it really boils down to, I believe that all humans, all people have equal value. That not one of us is more valuable than some other. And uh, anyone that's spent time traveling and seeing other people, you can't help but just have that touch you. And yeah. I went to the Middle East um, a few times, but I went to a refugee camp in Jordan and um, was able to uh, interact with, with the people there, these amazingly brilliant, innovative, driven people that wanted to start new lives. And uh, I, at the end of the day, was surrounded by these little children. And, um, you know, as I looked in their eyes, it, I couldn't help but look at them and just, and see the eyes of my own children and just think there's, they're so similar. Um, they have dreams and ambitions and they, they love their parents. And um, <clears throat> uh, instinctively, one of these little boys grabbed my hands and um, walked up my, my legs and then my body and did a little backflip <laughs> and um, took off his shoes when he did it, which I just thought was so, so polite kind. and uh, kind. And then all the little kids lined up and did this. And, um, it, you know, it was just a, a really special moment, a beautiful moment where mm -hmm. these children were able to forget that they were in a refugee camp. Um, the average child, average person lives in a refugee camp for 18 years. So, um, and then I, I went back to my hotel room in Amman that night and um, on TV saw 
uh, some news of a bombing in Aleppo, right across the border, and um, where a little child was pulled out of this rubble, just bleeding from his head and put in the back of an ambulance. And it just broke me inside. And, um, you know, this is what drives me. It's um, this idea that we can make a difference. And I can't change the world on my own. Uh, you know, I can't change it with this business, but I can make an impact in a few lives. And that's, I think if everyone in the world could, could see that and could have that hope, you know, I, I believe we could eradicate extreme poverty mm. in our lifetimes. And that's, that's my hope is that we can do that. And I, I hope that Cotabaxi can, can inspire others to, to try to find that ways to do that through their businesses or individually. So yeah. that's my hope. I mean, we live in a world where biz, business transaction is the norm. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just transactional. Mm -hmm. And yet you're looking to restore this level of humanity, not just at the core of like as a, as a, as a driving source of motivation for mm -hmm. you and for everyone at your company, but, but like actually instilling those principles of respecting and helping lift others and um, honoring the humanity in everyone. And how do businesses embrace that? Um, how does, what does that look like? Yeah. So I'd say, first of all, uh, I hope that others will look at what we're doing and do better like learn from what we're doing and try to do better. That's what we tried to do as we looked at other great brands that were that had social missions, Tom Shoes, Warby Parker. Right. Um, these are the founders are, are friends. They're actually investors in Cotopaxi. And we tried to learn lessons from what they did. And we tried to do something even a little deeper and, yeah. and tried to do more storytelling and try to really ingrain it more into who we were as a brand and culture. And I hope that the next generation of, of entrepreneurs will look at us and say, they did a good job, but like, I think we can do even better. Mm. Um, but I think that starts by, you have to embed this into everything that you do. You have to think about this in every, in every possible way, every aspect of the business. You need to think about, how can I tie in this mission into what we're doing? And I think if you can do that, that's where things really start to, to that's where you start to have meaningful change. So, I mean, a lot of times people will ask the question about, um, you know, you're having to make trade-offs and decision, tough decisions. And it's true, you do have to make tough decisions when, you're, when you have of this course. model. But the truth is, I think it's a false dichotomy, this idea that you have to either do good or do well as a business. Mm. I, I, I've seen that's they, completely they, false. They like, can coexist. They coexist and actually they complement each other. Yeah. I, the more that we're able to, to authentically give back and do good, mm. the more people love the brand, the more people feel like that represents the values that I have. And so I, yeah. I want to wear that product because it, it says it to everyone, yeah, th yeah, this is what I stand for. Right. And uh, then it creates more profits in the business, which mm -hmm. allows us to go do more good. And so like these two things, if you, if you do them right, you shouldn't have to be making trade-offs saying, well, we could be more profitable, uh, but we're gonna go do good instead. It's like, no, we're gonna go do good first. And we know that that's gonna pay back in the end. Yeah. And that's gonna, we're gonna have a business that's more viable that allows us to keep doing more good. Yeah, well, and it seems also to be like, it's a long tail. It's also like a legacy mentality of, we're building something that is not just a flash in the pan, let's make a quick buck, mm -hmm. but let's make a lasting difference in people's lives. Yeah, absolutely. Imagine if every one of the businesses that we interact with on a daily basis cared that much more, mm -hmm. the levels of happiness and empowerment and self-worth would increase globally, mm -hmm. you know? We're in this transition period from the information age into this like relationship economy age where it's the the brands and the companies that are can, going to continue to win and succeed are those that are making meaningful connections with all of their mm -hmm. all of their stakeholders. What really connects with people is the idea of like understanding there's a human connection between the products you're wearing and mm -hmm. uh, the person that made it. Oh, and yeah. so, yeah. or when you're wearing one of our our Del Dia backpacks, the ones that are like they're yeah, one of a kind, the they're super colorful. Right? Yeah, from yeah. the Philippines. It's like we gave the sewers creative power, a voice to yeah. go design Expressive. their own bags. Yeah. We didn't tell them how to make them. We said, yeah. make no bag alike. That's the only rule. And so they're choosing the colors, the <laughs> so materials. Awesome. And they, they, for the first time in 11 and a half years, on average, they've worked at this factory. Yeah. They've had choice in designing yeah. the bags. And so, so awesome. um, that's, that's, a, that's a special piece of this. When we started eating tacos a few years ago, um, I, you were, this is something you were passionate about. And, no. But I, it, w it went beyond just eating tacos. And I remember saying, you should write a book. And uh, you're like, actually. <laughs> actually, that's in the works. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, I want to hear, like, what lessons 
have you learned in the search for the perfect taco oh, that have tied man. back to? Yeah. Over the years and thousands of tacos later, um, I've, I've realized like what, one of the things that I've loved about the, go ahead. You might go for this. Yeah, this do one, the habanero, uh, yeah. Um, Housemade salsa. Yeah, yeah. too much. I might I pay for that. <laughs> I think you're I, probably gonna feel it. I'm gonna regret that. You like spice, yeah? <laughs> no, maybe not that much. <laughs> <laughs> when you go to like a, like a true taqueria experience, there are so many little things that they do that make you wildly loyal that you're just coming back for more. You love that place. That's your taco place. You want to keep going yeah. back. Like that's why El Fogón, mm -hmm. it's like, yeah, the tacos are great, but it's also the whole experience that you have when you're mm -hmm. there and how they take care of you. They make you feel like a VIP. They know your name, you know? <laughs> it's just, they they want, and, and it's the Mexican way to be like, te gustó la comida? It's like, did you like it? Because I want to know if you liked mm -hmm. it. If you didn't like it, then, I feel really bad and I want to make something that you like. And I realized over the over these thousands of tacos that those are some simple but really approachable principles that everyone can can learn from. Imagine if a business implemented principles like that, like you have done, you know, it's like this personalized touch of here's the refugee that we're employing that you're like, oh my gosh, that's so great. So I found through the taco experience that it is all about this human connection. You know, the taqueros like shaving it right there in yeah. front of you, flipping the pineapple, mm. catching it. It's this show, you're engaged, you're eating these tacos with other people. And it's, but there's and it's some, a there's highly also something personal experience. Really cool about Mexican culture, the way they connect with each other. Oh, yeah. and people... At Santos, we went to El Fogon, we were in Playa La Carmen for a New Year's Eve, New Year's weekend. And we went there and four times in three days, we loved it. And um, every time we were there, we asked for Santos, who was our who was our server the first day, and he was. Just, we just had such a ride with him. Like he treated us like we were, you know, royalty, and just took super good care of us. As did the entire team. And um, while we were taking the picture, this huge crash in the kitchen. Like I don't even know, twenty glasses this size like fell on the ground, shattered. So huge racket. And all of a sudden, there was like this split second moment of silence, and then the place just like erupted. All of the team and the staff, they were like, who, like yelling, screaming. They were like laughing, they're like cheering on this guy that just broke all of the glasses. And so that just made us laugh. So we were having this like, really, we're, we're like, this is so funny. I don't know why we're laughing at broken <laughs> glasses, but it's really fun. And mm -hmm. and I'll never forget this moment when Patrick, who was with us, he like reached in his pocket. He was having such a good time, unprompted, like just reached in his pocket, threw down a hundred pesos and put it in their tip jar. Just because they created this amazing, we like felt so good, this euphoric taco experience. And, um, and I'll never forget that because that's, that's the type of, that's why, that's why this search for the perfect taco even started was because um, I, in addition to, of course, like the tacos being, I think the best food on planet earth, it's what I've learned, what I've learned about life and about business and about more and about how to make an impact and, uh, and about how to reach people in a meaningful way. And that it's so simple. It's the eye contact. It's the smile. It's mm -hmm. the, how are you doing? You know, like, mm -hmm. let me get you your taco. You know, it's, it's powerful. I mean, so the hypothesis is, wait, you mean I'm gonna learn something transformative from, a, from my business or life from a taco stand yeah. in East LA? And I'm like, absolutely. You know, one thing I love about tacos too, on this point is that there's no right way to make a taco. Right. Right? There's like, there's infinite variety. Right. Like you've, You've had thousands of tacos. You've never had a duck taco. I've, I know. And it was, it was like amazing. I low with like crispy leeks on it. Yeah, yeah. and it was just amazing. It right? was. And so that's the great thing about business and life is like there's a beautiful way to do something that no one's ever done. Yeah. And um, it's good. Yeah. And it doesn't have to be like right. everyone else. And you can go create something that's different and unique and totally that's new, even though it seems like, totally. oh, everyone's done it already. Yep. You know, but you can uh, go do something in a unique way that'll that'll impact people. Yeah. What's your legacy look like? What do you want it to be? Um, well, I, first, I'd, I'd say I hope that I'm a good husband and father. Like that mm. matters a lot to me. Um, 
those are the people that uh, that make my life richer, and so I, those that matters a lot. I I'm ambitious, right? I, I have big ambitions and dreams, and I, I feel like I've um, been so lucky and blessed that I need to I need to I hope that I can inspire other people. I think of that mentor of mine that I mentioned, mm, Steve Gibson's yeah. his name, and mm. he changed my life. He put me on a different path in life, and I. My hope is that there are a few people out there that say, you know what, Davis Smith made me think a little bit differently and made me realize that like, I could, I could change the world in some small way um, mm-hmm. through what I do. And so that's, that, that's what I, I hope for. So, yeah. You're doing it. How about you? For what, sure. How about you? What's, I mean, mine is, yeah. is very similar. I want, I want the world to be a better place where, mm-hmm. uh, and, and I hope that whatever I do inspires people to feel a little bit more loved. Mm. feel more seen, feel mm. uh, a sense of worth and divine worth, really, because that's what I've felt. Mm. I've loved, I remember being so poignantly, like, touched with my experience in Nepal. Actually, two experiences, but one in Nepal, where... There's no tacos, there are no tacos in Nepal. I ate some tacos in Nepal, but I still go to, I still eat other food. Yeah, of course. <laughs> I don't know. I've only seen you is eat tacos. There other, is there other food? <laughs> there is no other food. No, yeah, I do eat other food. How did you survive? I know, it was weird. I killed my own, yeah. <laughs> Yak or yeah, something. Exactly. Um, no, but I remember this, they, this namaste mentality. Mm. It's very real. Like in Nepal, you feel it. That's how they greet each other. Mm. It's this divine in me recognizes the divine in you. And it's real and it's meaningful. And, and I feel that I have felt that personally. And I just want everyone to feel that. From my time this spent in uh, Guatemala too, I, with the Kekchi people there, I've gone back every summer for the past 10 years. And, and, uh, and they don't speak, many of them don't speak Spanish. Some of them do, but most of them speak their native Kekchi. And they have a phrase that's like changed my life. It's just their phrase like, how are you? But the phrase is actually literally translated as, are you happy in your heart? It's is like, right? yeah, masala chol, masala chol. And you're like, sain chol. Yeah, which means, yeah, I'm happy in my heart. And, mm. and that is, that's been something that's changed, changed my mentality, changed my paradigm of, am I happy in my heart? And how can I help other people feel happy in their heart and know, know who they are, who they are and, and their divine potential, mm-hmm. you know? And, and so that's what I want to do for the rest of my life. And if, if, uh, tacos are the vehicle to teach that and show that to people. Well, it and certainly help makes it. your heart happy. That's for <laughs> sure. Hearts happy, mm-hmm. but, uh, but I, it's more than, it's more than just the, the really delicious taco for me. Yeah. Um, that is, that is the, that's a very important part of it, but that's not the whole story. Well, you better eat that al pastor, man. It's, it's the, the al pastor is fantastic. What's one thing that you would suggest that a leader do to dial up, level up their, the effectiveness of their brand experience? What could they do within the next 24 hours? My, my experience, and this is by making mistakes along the way. My first two businesses, I did not do this. And I recognized, I, I really missed a big opportunity to create really a, powerful, a more powerful brand. Mm. And that is, uh, you know, if, you, if you're an entrepreneur, you're someone that's running a business, or if you're even like a, an, an area of influence in a business, maybe a senior leader, you need to sit down and identify your core values. Mm. And your individual, <clears throat> your individual your values, core values. Mm-hmm. and uh, or the and you know ideally those line up with the brand values. You know, for me, the values of Cotopaxi are three core values that we use in this business. Are my are th- my three core values, and yeah. so um, and then you build, yeah. and it takes time to do this, but then you go build a, the culture and the traditions and the rituals of this business around those values, mm. and uh, when you do that that's when you're going to have the biggest impact on your brand because it's going to be authentic and it's going to be, it's going to be true. It's, it's part who of you. you. Are. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh man. So many good, so many good thoughts. Mm. So much inspired insight. Well, thanks man. I can't read. Thank I you. can't wait to read your book. 
Me too. I want it. <laughs> I want it now. <laughs> Huge thanks to our host, Tuckania27, for creating the ideal place for us to talk about brand and customer experience. And this conversation was unforgettable for several reasons. My very first duck tacos and their watermelon guacamole of the day were very good. Davis turned the tables and asked me about my purpose. And well, that was really a lot of screen time with two bald guys. Join our epic taco journey on our website. You're not gonna wanna miss out on the national taco tour we're planning when we launch the book, The Search for the Perfect Taco. So follow us on social media, subscribe to our channel, and tune in to another episode of Taco Incidents, where we'll continue to explore the secrets to level up your brand experience and your taco game. Okay, just throwing this in here, El Pilon. There's another place you recommended uh, in Mexico City, and it's okay. like a place that's like really famous, I think, for fish. Uh, they do a lot of fish and seafood oh, and stuff. Oh, um, Contramar? Contramar. Oh. That place was unreal. Oh my gosh. I know. I know. We need to go together. What? Yeah, we do. We need to go together, because uh, plus, I don't know if you've wandered around Latin America with another bald white guy. <laughs> But we, I have a cousin who you know, McKay, oh, Thomas, yeah. and uh, we look very similar like you and I do. And uh, dude, it's just like everyone just stops and smiles like, and says, they're the like, hey, Melos, they're like twins. Uh, so <laughs> actually maybe the three of us should go together. We should go, just, they'd be teates, man. Yeah. They'd be like, who are these? This is like freak of nature. Why don't these guys have hair on their heads? And they're yeah. so white.